Buenas and half a day, everyone. Thank you for coming. The office, of, the office of Senator Selena Cruz Nelson will now convene this public hearing. It is 5.07 p.m. Today is Monday, August 23rd. For the record and in accordance with the open government law, public notices were sent via email to all senators, stakeholders, and all main media broadcasting outlets on Friday, August 13, 2021. And again on August 19, 2021. Notice was also pro provided on the Guam Legislature website. Joining me today are Senators Amanda Shelton, thank you for joining us, and Senators Tello Taidegui. Okay. Today on our agenda, we are here to discuss resolution number 130-36, which was submitted into the Committee on Rules on July 22nd. Resolution number 130-36 COR is relative to expressing the support of Imenai Trentai Sais Nalas Latour and Guahan for the passage of HR 4406, the Supporting Medicaid in the U.S. Territories Act of 2021, introduced by the Honorable Representative Darren Soto Sablon and the Honorable Representative Gus Bilirakis which seeks to amend Titles 11 and Title, 14, Title 19 of the Social Security Act to provide increased financial support to the territories under the Medicaid program to provide five years of Medicaid funding for Puerto Rico and eight years of funding for other U.S. territories and for other purposes. I have called this public hearing to the, so that we may hear from the community on their concerns and thoughts in regards to resolution number 130-36 COR, which seeks to express support for the passage of HR 4406, the Supporting Medicaid in the U.S. Territories Act of 2021. Unlike, unlike many states, Guam and other U.S. territories have a cap on the percentage of how much federal monetary assistance are to be allocated based on the federal medical assistance percentage for Guam's Medicaid program. Guam's FMAP is statutorily set at 55%. But after the passage of Public Law 116-94, the Further Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2020, our island received a temporary FMAP increase to 83%. This temporary increase is slated to expire on September of this year, September 2022. And the amount of federal support will also return back to 55%. Because of this upcoming expiration date, resolution number 130-36 COR strongly supports the passage of HR 4406 as this legislation will continue to support the citizens of Guam who are enrolled under the Medicaid program for additional eight years. And just to note that currently Medicaid serves one-fifth of Guam's population totally, totaling to nearly 35,499 beneficiaries. These additional funds provided by Congress in response to the unprecedented effects of the COVID-19 pandemic also was increased and increased Guam's federal medical assistance percentage from its statutory maximum of 55 to 83 percent in the previous year under HR 265. So this again is just a caveat to HR 265 to extend the uh, federal medical assistance percentage for territories and then from 55% to 83%, and we saw how Guam greatly benefited through HR 265, and so now we are here addressing this new resolution, HR 4406, so that we can again ensure that Guam will continue to receive this type of equity or equitable support from our federal government. And I'd like to thank those that are here to give testimony today or to provide uh, some answers on some of the questions the panel may have, Ms. Te Teresita Gumatauta and Ms. Janet Cruz. And I believe we have a written testimony by the Director of Department of Public Health, 
uh, Director Art St. Augustine. So um, you're welcome to read his testimony and also free to feel free to speak on this, on this measure. Thank you very much for being here today. Buenas and thank you very much, uh, Senator Talina, Senator Shelton, and Senator Tadegui. Uh, I will be reading from the, uh, the director's testimony. Okay, Buenas, the Department of Public Health and Social Services concurs with the resolution number 130-36 to support HR 4406 to amend the title 11 and 15 of the Social Security Act to provide increased financial support to the territories under the Medicaid program and other purposes. Before the passage of the Affordable Care Act, Public Law 116-20 and Public Law 116-94, the Guam Medicaid program operated with an annual budget ceiling allotment based on Section 1108 of the Social Security Act. Although the funding allotment increased yearly based on the Medical Consumers Price Index, it was insufficient to support the healthcare needs of Guam's Medicaid population. Public Law 1116-94 temporarily increased the Medicaid Federal Medicaid Assistance Program percentage, it's called FMAP, to 83% and increase the Medicaid cap for two consecutive years, ending on September 30, 2021, for the territories except Puerto Rico. The table that was provided, the Guam Medicaid expenditure, for the past several years continued to grow due to increasing medical costs brought by new drugs, advancing medical technology or new treatments and modalities and new health standards or mandates, not to mention the increase on healthcare services utilization. Additionally, the number of Guam Medicaid enrollees has also grown for the past several years, which will continue to increase with the inclusion of COFAs, citizens of the freely associated states. And the recent increase on the Guam Medicaid Income Guideline to expand coverages to the uninsured population of Guam. Extending the increase on Medicaid FMAP and CAP amounts for the territories will provide greater access to health care. Providers will continue to accept Medicaid patients knowing there is funding to compensate for their services. Thus, Medicaid patients will no longer delay seeing their physicians or go to the emergency room when their primary physician discontinue accepting them. This will lessen the non-emergency use of hospital emergency room and reduce the uncompensated care for emergency room use. Furthermore, this will provide Guam Medicaid the flexibility to develop innovative approaches uses using federal funding to purchase private insurance for some of its recipients. Additionally, it will also promote Guam's economic growth because providers will be paid timely, be able to treat more Medicaid recipients and have additional resources to spend which translate to greater tax revenues. Thank you for the opportunity to share DPHSS support on Medicaid funding issues. Thank you very much. Um, Mrs. Gumatato, can you go ahead and state your name for the record and your um, position? I'm sorry. My name is Teresita Gumatato, the administrator for the Bureau of Healthcare Financing Administration that oversees the Medicaid and MIP program. Okay, thank you. And uh, also thank you for providing the table of no those that are eligible. Um, we are looking at 2020, which is the most recent data that we have, and so that those that are eligible has increased to now 43,387 mm -hmm. from what was previously stated at the 35,000 mm -hmm. recipient mark. So I'll offer the panel if they have any questions or any comments, and we'll start with the Legislative Secretary, Senator Shelton. 
Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mrs. Gumitata, for your testimony tonight, of course, to the director and to the team at uh, Public Health for being here to support uh, this resolution so that we're able to uh, send our support, our united voice to Congress uh, for this effort. And I'm, I am looking at the, the chart that you provided and the testimony, and I was hoping that you can put on the record uh, the type of growth that we've seen uh, for Guam Medicaid enrollees. If you can tell us over the last uh, couple of years uh, what kind of increase we're seeing, those who are eligible for Medicaid. Can you repeat that again? Yes. I'm asking if you can say on the record uh, what has been the growth of eligible individuals on island for Medicaid. Uh, so we see this number that jumped from 2011 to 2020 mm -hmm. uh, from 35,000 to 43,000 and a lot of up and down in between. Uh, but what has been, uh, from your experience in this position, uh, if you can explain how we came to this, these numbers this way and what kind of steady growth that we're seeing. Is there, is there a pattern that you're seeing in people who are eligible? The first, one of the first increase we, that we expanded, I think it was, a, when was that, that we implemented the childless adult group that you guys call Medicaid NEG, new eligibility group. I think that's 20, 2021, around there. What happens is that Medicaid was expanded. I'm trying to remember, oh, because of, of the Affordable Care Act. It was expanded, they wanted Medicaid, Congress wanted to expand the Medicaid program to the childless adult group. Those are 19 to 64 years old. The 65 is considered already elderly. So the ones with 19 to 64, they're normally without insurance because they won't qualify under Medicaid because under Medicaid, it's either TANF, that's with family, that's children with family, parents, caretaker, relative, and pregnant women, and the elderly and disabled. So these individuals, the 19 to 64, are the ones that don't fall in the category. So we expanded the Medicaid program, the one Medicaid program, to include these childless adult groups. That's one of it. The other thing is uh, we also increased our, our cut at our poverty level for the program, and we are slowly increasing it again. We increased it again just this year, January 1st, 2021, to include the COFAS as well. And then, and that's probably one of the reasons why there's an increase is because it goes up and down is sometimes because, like I said, because of the two increase that we just implemented, plus the childless adult group being included in the program. Yes, thank you very much. I appreciate that information. So there has been an expansion of eligibility for the program and a mm -hmm. increase in the poverty mm -hmm. uh, level. So uh, that is the explanation for the, for the increase in those who are eligible for Medicaid. Uh, and so I'm thankful for that information to help us paint a fuller picture here of uh, the amount of people on island uh, and how this, uh, this House bill in the United States House of Representatives uh, will help us see a little bit more uh, funding coming in uh, for all of these individuals to cover their health care, their health coverage under the uh, federal med medical assistance program. So. Uh, thank you very much for the information today. Thank you, Senator Shelton. And I'd also like to acknowledge that we also have Ms. Janet Cruz from DPHSS here present with us today. And at this time, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, Senator Brown. Thank you for joining us today. And uh, Senator Teletidigui, do you have any questions or your comments for those giving testimony, please proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good evening, ladies. Thank you so much for taking time out after work. I know you're tired, and so I'll try to make it as short as possible. I know you, Mrs. Comitato, but next to you is... My name is Janet Cruz, and I'm the Hi. management analyst for the uh, healthcare financing. 
Buenas. administration. Oh, thank you so much for your name. Again, I appreciate uh, you, you being here to testify on something that, of course, is going to benefit Guam all the way. Um, it's important to have the representation, especially from the ones who actually work, do the work, and that's you. You know, usually we hear from uh, directors, and sometimes for us, I prefer those who are really in the trenches working and doing the job to provide the information. There was one, only one question I have. I'm trying to make it, we're all, I know this is in between dinner and stuff, so I'll make it quick. When it, you said this uh, um, initiative uh, provides uh, the ability for you to um, fund uh, private insurance uh, for some of the recipients. So currently, right now, we're able to utilize some of this funding, federal funds, to purchase insurance? Uh, probably with that, it's also, what we're trying to do is, it's more on the, because what's currently also happening right now is that under like the, under the program, the Medicaid itself, we have what they call the Medicare buy-in, Part B buy-in, and what we normally do is to assist the program in, you know, balancing, I guess, the funding or the share of the cost, is we purchase like the Part B premium. It's like around 100, 126 or $132 a month. So we purchase the Part B health insurance premium. At the same time, that means like for more on the dialysis, the dialysis payment or services will be paid by the Medicare Part B and we pay the co-insurance. So if you look at it, it does kind of save the program funding is one example. So probably in the near future, if we do have extra funding, we can purchase health insurance for these other individuals that don't qualify for Medicare. Right. But these are, it's just an, it's one of those programs that's under Medicaid and he has, because if you look at the costs, I'd re, rather pay the $126 of premium than to pay uh, what a $25,000 or $50,000 expenditure because that means Medicare Part B will pay it and we pay the coinsurance of the Medicare. That makes total sense, you know, and, and to do it. So it's, it's a win-win a here. Mm -hmm. I'm glad that uh, you ladies are looking into that to finding every possible way to save additional funding so that more people can be uh, uh, utilize this um, you know, this ability to, to receive Medicaid and, and moving forward to. Um, I did have another question. I lost my train of thought. It is the end of the day. <laughs> so uh, if I have any more questions, I'll give you a call. But thank you so much for all the hard work you're doing over there at Public Health. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Tidegui. Senator Brown, do you have any questions or comments at this time? Just very brief, certainly, Madam Chair, I have no problem supporting uh, Resolution 130, but I did want to get some feedback. I mean, we certainly can see the benefits that will come to Guam as a result of, if um, H.R. 4406 does pass. But if it doesn't, what, what's the consequence to Guam if we don't get this support with the passage of this legislation in Congress? What does it mean to our community if, if, if this doesn't pass, to get this additional support to Guam and the other territories? We might revert back to the way we used to be I think 20 years ago, public 2010. What happens is the expenditure will be carried over for next fiscal year or the government will pay for it for now. That, and then other providers, what can also happen is if we don't pay the providers timely, we could end up losing them. Mm -hmm. Right now, it is a challenge to get providers on board. Right now, they're coming on board because we're paying them timely for the last decade. So, so they're getting know. timely, they'd be yes. getting timely payments, but yeah. you're right, I mean, before we often heard about that, yeah. where so providers right would we're, stop providing and the then patients, them, yeah, so. we're not getting the service. Mm -hmm. So they're yeah. participating, but I'm just kind of worried that if we don't pay them timely, they might just revert back to cutting services or limiting services. They're gonna say, oh, we can only see five of your patients per day, that's it. And then these, these patients perhaps may not get the medical care that, yes. or visits that they need as a consequence mm -hmm. of that, right? No, I appreciate it. I, I certainly, as I mentioned, Madam Chair, anything that can support getting more resources to our economy and to our community, particularly for 
medical care, I think we all agree is important, and we certainly appreciate uh, any support we can, additional support we can get from the federal government to cover these costs, particularly for, you know, our, ne our neighboring islanders that are coming into Guam, mm -hmm. who, uh, you know, in a number of cases are uninsured and don't have, uh, may not have the resources to get of the finances for the medical care or their own individual insurance. So mm -hmm. I think we can see all the pluses with regards to supporting Resolution 130. With that, Madam Chair, thank you very much for the opportunity to comment. Thank you also for coming and, and joining us this afternoon. Thank you, Sen Senator Brown. Mrs. Cruz? Yes, if I may add also, um, if we were to divert back to our, our cap, and our cap funding would be for 2022 in the event the, uh, the bill does not pass in Congress. We're looking at $19. million in federal funds. So like what Ms. Kumatauta had mentioned, that that would definitely uh, hurt our community and our services, healthcare services will be then limited. And uh, those who are participating, uh, we might end up re diverting our uh, income level to a lower income level because we're not able to develop uh, providing the services to the community. So we're definitely in full support of this current bill. Thank you very much, Mrs. Cruz. So just to clarify, uh, traditionally before COVID, Guam was receiving 55% of the federal, federal Medicaid uh, percentage, right? And so now because of COVID, the legislation moved up to 83%. Yes. Can you please just give the community an idea of what the cost is, the dollar amount between the 55% coverage and the 83%? Uh, one example is, okay, from the, if it's 55%, of course you take $100 of the expenditure, 55% of that is, like you said, $55 versus $45. Okay, out of the 100. So, but now that it's 83%, which is gonna expire in, I think as soon as the, the, this fiscal year, if this public health emergency doesn't get extended, it will it'll expire. So, but right now, it's at 89, 89.2 because of the public health emergency. Okay, so you take 89% of $100, that'll be $89 at least, and probably $11, yeah, 11 is what the local would pay. So what is the overall cost? I, right I know you yes, what is the overall cost between the 55% that of the percentage and then now that the 83%, what is the difference yeah. in the overall cost? It went from 83 to 89.2%. So you're asking what is the 89% of the total expenditure that Yes, currently. Okay, for for 2021, okay. Here, right. Here. This is the expenditure for 2021. Yeah, we're trending at right now $103,677,000. $60.72. That's total computable for the, okay? So right now on, on the 89.2 and 10.8, well 89.2 federal, 10.8 local. Right now the federal is spending, for the total computable, it's just, just say 66 million, 280,174. 0.29 at that, the federal share for that is 59,121,915.46 versus the local is only 7,158,258.82. And that's, this 7 million is 10.8% local. And so the additional 7%, the 7.2%, because the original HR 4406 speaks of increasing to 83% or keeping 83% as a standard for the upcoming years. Uh, the additional 7% is, 
is a reason because we are currently in a pandemic. Yes. Is that correct? 6.2. 6. 6. 6, 6.2? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. I, I really want to thank you for coming. I know we started at 5 o'clock, so it's kind of we had to beat the traffic. And, huh. and uh, thank you for spending your extra time here with us and providing the community with this uh, input and also for the hard work that you and your team have done throughout this pandemic. So thank you very much. The community and us, we owe you a debt of gratitude for keeping us safe during the unknowns, right? And the, the uncertainty of, of the last year. So thank you very much for all that you do and your team. Okay, if there are no questions or comments, no further questions or comments, we'll go ahead and adjourn this public hearing. It is 5.32 p.m. Thank you very much and have a good day. God bless.